Stanford University. Okay, welcome to lecture number four of Stanford CS 193P, Developing Applications for iOS. Uh, today we're going to finish up what we started uh, on Tuesday with foundation, talk a little bit about the collection classes and how to enumerate them and um, what we mean by the term property list, which is um, related to that, and also a little about user defaults, which is also related to property lists. And once we finish up all that foundation stuff, we're actually going to go back to talking about uh, the language, although not really about the language, but about how we use the language. Uh, specifically, how do we create objects, and then how do we manage the memory for those objects, okay? And uh, then I'm going to do a demo at the end, which is going to be a demo of some of these collection classes, uh, NS number, introspection, a lot of the things you're going to need for your homework this week. Uh, so hopefully I'll leave enough time to be able to do a lot there until so you'll be able to see really how to do most of the things that we're going to ask you to do on your homework. So more on foundation framework. Let's talk about arrays. So every language, arrays are really fundamental and important uh, to building anything complicated. And so foundation has this class NS array, which is an ordered collection of objects. Okay, they're in order. So uh, if you want the object at index number five, it's always going to be at number five. It doesn't, you know, move around. It's in and it's in order. Um, it's immutable. This is the same thing I said about NS string. An NS array, once you create it, you cannot add objects to it, you cannot remove objects from it. Okay, this is NS array. And we'll talk about the mutable one in a minute. Uh, some of the important methods that are in NS array, count is really important, that's how many objects are in the array. Also, object at index, that says give me the object that's at this index in the array. Okay, these are kind of the fundamental primitives of NS array. It's got some other kind of fun methods like make objects perform selector. Uh, you give it a selector. We talked about selectors on Tuesday. That's basically a representation of a message or a method uh, invocation. You give it a selector and it'll make all the objects in the array perform that selector. So that's kind of fun. Um, you can also sort the array using a selector where the selector basically takes an argument which is another object, compares the object that it's currently sorting with that other object returns whether it's greater than or less than and by doing that it sorts it for you. So that's kind of a cool way to do sorting without having to write any code. Um, it also has this interesting method last object which you think why, why would they have last object if, you know if you have object at index count minus one or whatever. But last object is fun and convenient because it returns nil if there are no objects in the array. Because otherwise even if you do object at index zero in an array that has no objects, that will raise an exception, that will crash, okay? So you can't access objects uh, that are past the end of the array's size. If you do, program crashes. So your bounds checking still matters, even though it's an object-oriented array. And last object is a good way to kind of get the object from the end of it. If you're doing a stack or something like that, especially it's nice, um, makes your code read a little nicer than having to constantly check to see if count's zero. So the mutable version of this, okay, what are the differences? It's a subclass of NS array nominally. Um, its important methods are add object, that adds an object at the end of the array, so that makes the array grow in size and adds one at the end. Uh, insert object, so you can actually put objects in the middle and things move out of the way, right, they bump down. And then remove object, which removes an object uh, from that index. Okay, so this is the array that you're probably feeling like you really want. Uh, but you'll be surprised how little you use NS mutable array and how much you use NS array. Okay, same way with string. I know when you saw string was immutable, you were probably like, what? I want the mutable version. But it turns out you'll use NS array a lot more than a mutable array. And you'll see as we uh, go through the quarter and the different assignments why that is. But they do both exist and they're perfectly, you can use either one. Uh, so dictionaries. Dictionaries are basically a hash table. Everyone should know what a hash table is. You essentially have a key and you use it to look up a value. All right. It's immutable as well. Once you've created the dictionary, you cannot add more keys and values. All right. And any key that goes into the hash table uh, to the dictionary has to implement these two methods, hash and is equal. 
Now there are basic implementations of this down at the NS object layer, but uh, they're probably hash, probably just checks the pointer. Uh, so it's really not a very good ha hash, and is equal might even be the same. So uh, really, to have something be a key in an NS dictionary, it wants to sensibly implement hash and is equal. Uh, by far the most common key in a dictionary is a string. It implements those. Um, it knows how to compare itself to another string that might not be the, a pointer to the same in instance, but it has the same characters in it, and so it's equal. Uh, and it knows how to create a unique hash based on the string. So keys are usually NS string objects. But not always, they don't have to be. Uh, important methods here, count, same thing, that's how many keys, key value pairs. Uh, object for key, that's the other primitive, give it a key, gives you back an object, very straightforward. Uh, it also has some methods like all keys, which will return you an array of all the keys. Right? Makes some sense. And all values as well, you can get those. The mutable version of the dictionary, again, you'll, this one you'll actually use a little bit more than like mutable array and mutable string. Uh, set object is the way you put an object in the hash table. And remove object for key is how you remove one. Okay? So those are the primitives for the mutable. It also has some nice convenience functions like this add entries from dictionary where you, ha you have a dictionary already exi existing with a bunch of keys and values. Maybe you want to add some more keys and values. All right, but the other one is immutable. So you'll send, you'll create a mutable, direct, di mutable dictionary, send this message to it, and it'll transfer all the keys and values over from the other dictionary. And actually all of these foundation collection classes have a lot of methods that you really want to familiarize yourself with because they can save you a lot of time and programming angst by just doing, using the methods they have. Okay, so take a look at those, really familiarize yourself with those uh, three classes especially. The fourth collection class is NSSet, which sometimes is uh, the weak stepsister of the other ones, but turns out set is a pretty valuable way to represent a bunch of objects as well. A set is an unordered collection of objects, and all the objects have to be unique, so you can't have any duplicates. An array could have the same objects in it a hundred times, right, at each index. But a set, all the objects have to be unique, and it's not ordered, so you can never say object add index. Okay, so it's immutable. Uh, it's important methods count, as usual, how many are in this set. Uh, and really important method is contains object. Okay, returns a boolean whether this set contains this object. You're gonna, you can imagine using set, you learn in computer science, I'm sure, set theory and things like that. You can imagine using NS set for some of the problems you would solve using set theory. Um, it also has a cool method called any object. It'll just return any random object out of the thing. And we'll show, show you why that is cool. Uh, it, it also returns nil if there's no objects in there. But it's also very valuable some, for some other things. You got a question back there? Do the other foundation classes have the same object also? Um, probably Array does. Uh, oh, sorry. The question is, uh, do the other classes besides set have this method contains object? I, I'm sure they probably do. I don't remember offhand which ones do, but I think Array probably has that. Uh, question? Yeah, so the question is, why do we make such a big deal here about we have the immutable versions of all these things, and then we have the, so we have the immutable ones, and then we have the mutable ones. The main answer to that question is memory management. And we're going to talk about that later today. If you have an immutable thing, you know, its memory doesn't have to be owned, you know, somebody's managing that memory. You can pass these immutable ones, the read-only ones, you can pass them around and they kind of ephemerally come and go as people need them. We've been using all immutable strings, for example, when we did the display.txt, set a string by a pending string, those are all immutable strings. Um, we haven't used any mutable strings as yet, for example. And in the demo today I'm going to do, I will do a mutable thing, just so you can see what that looks like. But the answer to your question is memory management. That's why we do that. Question? Um, does contains object compare like, to pointers, or can it like, matter? Like, is there a comparison function that compares to objects? Yeah. Like right, so the question does, does contains object mean this object pointer is in the set, or does it mean there's an object equal to this object, you know, is equal in a semantic sense to it. And let me go down here and I'll talk to you about a couple other methods. Just make objects perform. Here's a method that does the is equal. Okay, member. So member 
set, does is equal on the object to find out if it's in there and returns the object that it found that matched. Okay? Whereas contains object is telling you this object itself, this instance is in their set. Okay? And those are two different things, subtle difference, but important. Um, mutable set, mutable version uh, has add object and uh, remove object. And it also has three kind of cool union, minus, and intersect set where you can take two sets and uh, say union them and get a new set. You know, you have a mutable set, you union it with another set and you'll get a larger set, right? So that's one of the things that you might want to do with a mutable set that you wouldn't do with a regular set. Mutable sets, medium commonness, because a lot of times you're creating them, you're collecting some classes, and we're going to use a mutable set, hopefully if we have time, in the demo today. You'll see why we do that. Uh, all right, so enumeration. So you've got these dictionaries, arrays, sets, and now you want to enumerate through all the items in there, either all the keys or all the values in a dictionary or all the values in an array or a set. How do you do that? And there is language support for this, uh, I believe uh, similar to what's in Java, if I can remember, I can never remember which languages have which things, but I think Java has this one. Uh, it's basically for in, all right? And it looks like this. So if I wanted to enumerate through all the objects in an array, I would say uh, my array, NS array star my array equals something. So I have an array that I got from somewhere, I made it myself or somebody gave it to me. And then I just say for variable typed, so in, in a string star string. Now I could type string outside of the loop, but usually we do it right here in line. For variable in my array, and then inside the curly braces, the variable string in this case will have the next item in the array. So it's just a for loop where it's iterating through, enumerating through actually um, each of the items in the array. So every time through there, this is going to ask the next object in the array, what's your double value, for example. Okay, make sense? Question? Yeah, so the question is, what if my array has mixed objects, not all NS strings? And I'm going to show you that right now. It's like a shill in the audience for me. Um, so what if you had a set, let's say, or it could be an array or whatever, but I'm just going to say a set to show you something different, where in the set is different kinds of objects. Might be strings, could be numbers, could be other kind of things. So how would that work? Well, we would just do four, when we do our four, we'll do four ID obj, okay, instead of NS string star string, I'm going to do ID obj in my set. And then inside the curly braces, I'm going to be careful what I do in there, okay, because obj is ID, pointer to any kind of object. I'm extremely likely to want to do some introspection there. Ask it what kind of class it is and then maybe send it that kind of message, or if it's another kind of class, send it a different message. This makes this code make sense? We're going to do that today uh, as well in demo. Uh, looping through the keys or values of a dictionary, exactly the same. So here I have a dictionary whose keys could be any kind of object, and so I say for id key in my dictionary. Uh, that, uh, the for in for dictionaries goes through the keys, not the values. And if you want the values, you would just send object for key to the dictionary inside the loop, and you get the values, right? You look up the hash table. Uh, notice here that uh, key is not an NS string star, it's just an ID, but I don't need to do any introspection to do object for key on it. Okay, NS dictionary, you can pass any object to object for key. If there's no hash in there, if it doesn't hash well, or it hashes but it doesn't equal the thing once it's hashed, uh, then you're just going to get nil. All right, because there's going to be no object for that key. All right, so that's enumeration for in. You're definitely going to be doing that. All right, so property list. So the term property list, we just define it when we're working in iOS. And all it really means is any collection at any depth of these six classes, NS array, NS dictionary, NS number, NS string, NS date, and NS data, okay, which are all classes we've talked about in the last two lectures. And they could be subclasses of them. They could be mutable versions of them as well. Uh, but uh, if you build any structure out of these, then we call that a property list. So for example, an array would be a property list if all the members in the array were also property lists. So if they were all strings or if they were all arrays of something that is also a property list, then that would be 
call it, you'd be able to call that array a property list. Or for a dictionary, all the keys and all the values must all be property list. Okay? So I use an example here, an array of dictionaries whose keys are strings and values are NS numbers, that would be a property list because all the keys and values and all the values of the arrays, everything is all um, one of those six classes. Why do we define this term property list? Why, why do we even say this? Uh, because there's some API throughout the SDK that uh, can operate on property lists. Okay? It's a method that will say something like this one, write to file, uh, you specify a path. Uh, the variable I have there in the square bracket is plist, so that's the thing I'm sending it to. Um, that could be an NS array, NS dictionary implements this method, but the bottom line is the thing you send it to has to be a property list, so it can't be an array with other things in there besides the six magic uh, foundation classes, or this, will, this method will not work, okay? And you'll see some property lists. Your ho first homework is gonna require you to implement some API that takes and receives property lists as well. And that's mostly, I put that in there so that you, A, understand the concept of property lists, and B, so you understand how to work with dictionaries and arrays, because that's really one of the main focus points of today's homework, is how to work with all this stuff. All right, one other miscellaneous foundation thing I want to throw in here because uh, it's very related to property lists, so this is really appropriate time to throw it, throw it in here, is NS user defaults. So NS user defaults is lightweight storage of property lists, okay? And that storage persists between launches of your application. So it's like preferences, right? Things that your user, you want to store about what your user is doing that the next time they launch, you want to have that information available. However, it's not a SQL database, okay? It's basically very, it's for small things, arrays of strings, maybe a dictionary with arrays as the values, but then the arrays have strings again. You know, small stuff. It's really for user preferences, basically, or for, for maybe uh, storing the way the user interface is currently laid out so when they come back, it's that way again, uh, things like that. Uh, you read and write from NS user defaults using this uh, shared instance called standard user defaults. You can see I'm sending this class method, uh, standard user defaults, to the class, NS user defaults. I'm getting the shared instance. Okay, it's shared. Every time you call this, you get the same instance. And then you can send it a me uh, different messages, like this one is set array for key. And so RV array right there would have to be an NS array. Now, the items in the NS array can be any property list items. So it'll keep going down and down, uh, following inside of the collections. And then the for key is just how you, the string you're going to use to look it back up when you read it back in. So what do some of the methods look like? Uh, you can set all primitives. So there's like set double, set int, set bool. Uh, you can get them back. So integer for key. Uh, notice integer for key returns ns integer instead of int. NS integer is just a type def that makes it so, depending on what platform you're on, you get a 32-bit int or a 64-bit int if you're on a 64-bit machine. You can treat it the same as if it were an int. It's a primitive, uh, it's a type def to a primitive type. And then uh, set object for key, that works as long as obj is a property list. It can be any property list. Uh, array for key is a little different than just getting an object for key because if that object that's in the user defaults for that key is not in array, this will return nil. So that's a subtle difference than just saying object for key. Yeah? Uh, can NS user defaults be shared between applications versus? No. The question is, can NS user defaults be shared between applications? And the answer is absolutely not. Okay, we're gonna, one thing you're going to learn when you run your application is there's very strict boundaries between applications. There's a sandbox that you get to play in that you can't see other application sandboxes for obvious reasons. Okay. Um, one thing you always have to remember with NS user default is after you've made a batch of changes, you know, set double for key, this, uh, you want to say standard user default, synchronize. Synchronize basically writes it out to disk, you can think of it that way. It also would read it in, uh, although on the iPhone, uh, when you're doing iOS programming, you really don't have to worry about that. As soon as you start asking for keys, it's going to read it in, okay? But every time you do it. And, you could do it after every single change or like after a little group. If you're going to change five things at once, change all five and then synchronize. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so that's it from the foundation. So this next stretch of uh, topics is all about allocating and initializing objects and then how we manage the memory of them. 
This can seem, the first time you see it, like, oh my gosh, all these rules, how am I ever going to keep up with all this memory and these objects? But you're going to find that when you start programming, there's actually very little to do. Because of the way that this is all structured, most objects, you're getting them, ownership is obvious, and you don't even have to um, explicitly go into the memory manage, uh, management of it. And so we'll see why that works. But we'll start with creating objects. How do you create an object? And you've already seen this because you created your calculator brain in your assignment number one. And you created it by doing this alloc init, nested alloc init, remember that. So that's always the way we create new objects in the heap. Okay, now creating objects is different from asking some other object to make an object for us. This is objects we're creating ourselves in our code, right? So we always send alloc, which is a method that we inherit from NS object, and then we always send it some initializer. It might not be init, I-N-I-T, uh, that's, ob that's NS object's initializer. Uh, we might have a more complicated initializer, but we always send it some initializer, and we always do it nested. Do not separate your alloc on one line and then put your init's on another line, okay? It just leads to bugs. Just don't do it. Don't ever do it. I can't ever think of a case ever where that's been the right thing uh, to do. You might think of one, but don't do it. Um, so like I say, alloc makes space in the heap that's big enough to include all this class's variables. And it sets them all to zero. So if you have any ints in there, they're zero. If you have any uh, object pointers in there, they're nil. Okay. Now, I put a lot of text up here because I want you to be able to go back and refer to this later. But the gist of this line is that every class has to have what's called a designated initializer. This is its focal point initializer. It's the, it's the initializer that takes the minimum arguments required to successfully initialize that, ca that class. Okay? Now for NSObject, it's init. So if you subclass NSObject, you inherit that as your des designated initializer. Right? If you need to put a different designated initializer at your uh, level of, of, of inheritance, you need to call your supers designated initializer. All right? So this is um, not supported by the language. You can't, there's no at sign something to say this is my designated initializer. You have to do it with documentation. All right? So it's definitely something because of that, because it's documentation only, sometimes people don't read the documentation, you can get subtle bugs if you subclass some class and you don't call its designated initializer uh, in super. Or if you get confused about what your own designated initializer is and you have a couple of other initializers that are like convenience initializers uh, and they're not going through your designated initializer and then someone subclasses you and they try to call your designated initializer but it doesn't work if you call it convenience. You can see how it gets a little messy. So the main thing here uh, and you can read through this at your leisure. Uh, the main thing is that you have to think when you design a class, what's my designated initializer and what's my super classes? All right, and I'm going to show you why that matters in code in a second here. Um, all init methods, whether it's just init or init with something or other, uh, are typed to return ID. Okay, now this sometimes people say, what? why would that be? Why isn't NSObjects init typed to return NSObject star? Well, that's because when you start subclassing and then you start calling super init, you're going to have some kind of um, unfortunate casting going on inside your initializers because your initializer, you might override NS objects init and your wants to return your class star. Well, that's going to conflict with uh, what NS object is doing. So that's why, just by convention, we make all our initializers typed to uh, return an ID. However, when the callers create your object, or when you call another object to create it, you should statically uh, assign the return type. So see, I have my object star obj equals my object alloc init. Well, my object alloc init returns an ID, but it's going to be assigned to this static thing. So right off the bat, the compiler is going to be able to help me make sure I don't send the wrong kind of message to that thing. Okay, and the compiler will, looks at this as like a cast, so it's not going to warn you that oh, you're assigning a static thing to ID. All right. So let's look at the code here. Uh, that's the best way to understand this whole uh, initializer business. So here's an example of a direct subclass of NSObject, and I have two versions of it here. 
So let's look at the version on the left. They're the same. The, the two versions are the same. It's just the code style is a little different. So let's look at the one on the left there. You can see that, uh, oh, so yeah, so my object here is a direct subclass of NS object. So you can see in its init, it's saying if super init, then, in other words, if super init does not return nil, then initialize our subclass, whatever instance variables we have, and return self. Otherwise, we're going to return nil. So there's this convention that if an initializer returns nil, it means it failed to initialize. Okay? So when you create an object, uh, ostensibly you should check to make sure that the initializer doesn't fail and return nil. In reality, we almost never do that for two reasons. One, initialization almost never fails. Uh, but two, remember that sending a message to nil is okay, and so you might have code path later where if that thing really came back nil, some other if would fail because you send a message to nil, it returns zero, you know, that's implicitly false, et cetera. Um, so this is a little odd. People look at this and they're like, what is this if super init? That's weird, but we definitely, that's a convention to do it that way. And actually we do it usually more on the right, which is really strange because you're going to say, what? Self equals self, you don't assign self. Uh, but actually self is just, turns out to be an instance variable, and you can assign it, and so only in our inits, that's the only place we would ever do this, we do this weird thing, if self equals super init, then we initialize it, else, and then we return self at the end. Now why do we do it the way on the right? There's kind of a coding style idea, which I buy into, which is that you don't want to be returning out of the middle of ifs. You see the one on the left? It returns two different places inside curly braces of ifs. It's better to have your return right at the bottom. Okay? So we're using self uh, as our variable to collect whether it's, it, you know, in this case nil or not, and then returning at the bottom. So I just, if you see the code on the right in an example, I didn't want you to freak out and say, what the, he never showed us that. Uh, but it's essentially similar to the one on the left. Question? Where are you allocating numbers in this? Or is it something that happens before? Okay. So the question is, where are we allocating memory here? And the answer is, we're not. Remember that to create an object is two steps. One is alloc, that's where we alloc the memory. Now we're initting, initializing. So the memory's already been created because someone's called alloc, is the answer. Okay, so we're not talking about it. And alloc, there's really only one other way to alloc. Uh, there's this alloc from zone, basically, where you can zone your memory, but we don't ever do any of that in this class. It's alloc is how you alloc. The question is, can you call init more than once on the same object? And the answer is, don't do that. Okay? That is not the semantic you want to have. Okay, so don't do that. That's a very good question, because sometimes it seems like, oh, I need to reinitialize my object now. I'm going to call this initializer again. Okay, don't do it. Basically, the convention is, we don't do that. So design your object so that that's the case. And that's definitely the case in iOS. You will never call an init of any kind twice on an object that's um, in the iOS SDK. All right, so here's another example. Uh, this is a subclass of calculator brain where, I've where it has a convenience initializer. This is not a new designated initializer. Calculator brain's designated initializer in this case is still init. Okay? So I've come up with this idea, what if we wanted to have our calculator brain be able to have an array of valid operations. Probably it should be a set, but let's say an array of valid operations. And so we want to have an initializer that says initialize with valid operations. But we're going to define our semantics that if they don't provide any valid operations, then we'll just assume all operations are valid. Okay, so that makes this a convenience initializer. It does, it's not required, this valid operations array. Therefore, we don't want to make it our designated initializer because then we're forcing people to call this when they could just pass nil. If that's what you want, let them call init, the designated initializer uh, you get from NS object. But notice in the implementation of a convenience initializer, we call self designated initializer. You see that? Self equals self init. Kind of weird. But init is our designated initializer. Now, we may or may not have an implementation of init, but we certainly inherit one from NS object because it's NS object's designated initializer. Right? And then we can use a property or something to set our valid operations to the array. Okay? Now, if that self equals self init had failed and returned nil, would that line self.valid operations equals an array, would that fail? Would that crash or anything? The answer is no. Because remember, if you send a message to nil, 
it just does nothing. It doesn't crash, it's just like it did nothing. If it has a return value, it would return zero, but it does nothing. And when you say self.valid operations, you're calling the setter of the valid operations property. So you're essentially invoking a method. So if self would nil right there, that line, nothing would happen. Okay, I put that intentionally just to remind you about this property stuff. All right, um, so yeah, I talked about that. So now here's calculator brain with a designated initializer. Okay, so now I've changed my mind and I've decided valid operations is required. You have to have valid operations and it has to have at least one valid operation in it uh, or we are not going to allow you to initialize this class. So now I'm calling uh, self equals super init. Okay, why am I doing that? Because this is my designated initializer. I need to call my super's designated initializer from my designated initializer. Okay, so that's why I'm calling super, because that's NS objects. And then I'm checking the array to make sure it has something in it. And if it does, then I'm going to set my valid operations to an array, and off we go. Otherwise, I'm going to say self equals nil and return self. In other words, I'm going to fail to initialize, because I'm requiring that the valid operation list have at least one operation in. I could probably, I should probably go on to check if that operation, that array item is even uh, a valid operation, but in any case, you get the idea here. Notice at the bottom, I always wince to even read this, but you see I have init, I've had to return nil. Okay, why is that? Because it, it's not valid to have a calculator brain without a valid operations thing, so if someone calls alloc init on me, I have to return nil because I'm not in a valid state, all right? So I do all this to emphasize that if you're going to have a, a requirement in your object that it can't really function until it's been initialized in a certain way, you have to make that a designated initializer. And from there, you have to call your super's designated initializer. The other thing I need to say right there is, this is bad design, all right? You do not want to build objects like this if you can help it. It's much better to build objects that will sensibly default in some way if you send init or some simpler thing. You don't want to build a bunch of requirements to make your object work. Now sometimes you can't avoid it. You're going to have an object, it needs some piece of information or it just doesn't make sense to exist. That's fine. But don't do it willy-nilly. Question? Um, that's an extremely good question. Um, let me see if I can remember how that happens. Uh, I think the answer there is, oh, sorry, the question is, what happens to the memory that got alloced if you send init and it returns nil? And I think you leak. Um, having init return nil is really an error condition, right? Your code should never call init here. That would be just a mistake. So you, probably the right thing to do in init is like raise an exception or something. Have your program crash. Um, it's definitely not it's an error condition. It's not normal operation. Oh, I didn't init, I'll return nil. Because yeah, you're going to leak that memory. We'll talk about memory leaking in a moment here. All right. Uh, let's talk about another class that you're going to subclass a lot, which is UI view. Okay, a view represents a rectangular area on the screen that you're going to draw in. Its designated initializer uh, is init with frame, which takes a rectangle. So it says, where is the rectangular area on the screen? Now. Um, you could argue why does it need that rectangle, but the, the design is that it does. So you cannot create a UI view without specifying, specifying an initial rectangle for it is the bottom line on that. And so like here's an example of creating a view. UI view star equals UI view alloc init with frame my frame, where my frame is some, uh, some rect, some rectangle on screen. Uh, and this would not generate a warning because again, it's like you're casting and the compiler figures you know what you're doing here. Um, I want to show, I'm going to go through this pretty quick because we need time for the demo. But here's two implementations of a subclass of UI view. Okay? One is going to keep init with frame as its designated initializer, and it adds a convenience method, init to fit. So this view takes some class shape star, which I'm not showing you what it is, it's just some made up class. And you can create this view by saying UI view alloc uh, init to fit and give it a shape. Okay? Now, what that class is going to do is calculate the rectangle of that shape, or a rectangle for that shape, uh, and then init with frame. In other words, call its designated initializer on itself. Right? And then our init with frame is going to call super init with frame because that's our super's uh, designated initializer. Um, then here's another implementation where it's the other way around. Let's say you can't create this view without providing a valid shape. 
It just won't let you do it. In that case, it's going to call the designated initializer of super over here in the init to fit. Okay? Because that's the designated initializer of this UI view. And then the init with frame is just going to call our own des designated initializer. Okay, so hopefully that's enough examples for you to understand this designated initializer calling super. Um, you probably still have a you know problem with that at some point, uh, but I, I, hopefully you can refer back to these slides and, and uh, get it straight. Okay, so that's it for init. So we've talked about allocation. We've talking about init. So now that's not the only way to get an object. And we've seen this all over the place because we wrote our calculator. We only alloced init initted once. All the rest of the time, we're throwing objects all over the place, and we didn't alloc init any of them. So there are plenty of classes, you know, hundreds of classes with hundreds of methods each sometimes uh, that will give you an object. So for example, ns string new display equals display dot text string by appending string digit. You probably recognize something similar to the calculator, right? So there's a couple of objects being given out here. Display.text, that's a string property on UI label that's returning a string. And then we're taking that string and sending it a message string by appending string. That's creating another string, okay, and returning it. So we create two strings there. Uh, also, some of the methods I showed you, like dictionary all keys, that creates an NS array, okay, with all the keys in there. Or string lowercase string returns a new string. That's lowercase. They're both immutable. The one, well, the one you send it to may or may not be, but the one it returns is immutable. The same thing, number with float that we sent to NS number. That returns a num new number object. So you can see all kinds of new objects being created all the time. The real question is, who frees all this memory? Who is responsible for freeing the memory that's being allocated for all these objects? Okay, not just these ones above, but all these alloc init things. All right? No garbage collection. So that before, so on some platforms, the memory is just garbage collected, right? Anything in the heap that doesn't have a pointer to it eventually gets collected, and that memory is used. We don't have that here, okay? Not on iOS. On the Mac, actually, they do have garbage collection in Objective C, but not on the iOS platforms. So what is the answer? Reference counting, okay? We're going to reference count these objects, and that's how we're going to know when to free them. So how does that work, re reference counting? It's basically a simple set of rules that everyone has to follow, and if everyone follows it, then everyone will be happy. But we all have to work together on this one, okay, inside of our code. All our methods, all our objects have to all kind of agree and do this the same way for this to work. The main rule is that you have to take ownership for an object if you want to keep a pointer to it. All right? So you have an object in your code somewhere. If you want to keep a pointer to that object, you have to take ownership, and we'll talk about how to do that. And multiple owners for an object is okay. You could have a hundred owners for an object. Okay? So anyone who wants to keep a pointer to that object has to say they want to own it. Then when you're done with the object, you're saying, okay, I've done everything I want to do. I don't want any more. You give up the ownership. Okay? Now, that might seem kind of restrictive, but there's a special magic piece of this, which is that you can actually take temporary ownership of objects. And that's really important for handing objects off to other, uh, ob other code, other objects. You need to be able to kind of temporarily own it until they've had a chance to decide whether they want to own it. And if nobody does, then it just goes away. Okay? So that's a key piece of this temporary ownership. And that's what's happening with all the stuff we're doing, calculator, brain, et cetera. So let's talk, we'll talk about how that works. When finally no one claims any ownership for an object, okay, everyone said, I don't want to own it anymore, the system will deallocate that object. Okay, its memory will be reused to the heap. If you send a message to an object at that point, it'll crash, okay, because you're pointing to garbage in the heap, basically. All right, so when do you have to take ownership? Uh, or sorry, when do you, this is kind of, poorly worded, when do you get ownership, or, or wh what makes it so that you get ownership when you say, I want ownership? Um, probably the s most straightforward way is any time you call a method that starts with the letters N-E-W, A-L-L-O-C, or C-O-P-Y, the convention is the object you get back, you own. Okay? So you recognize one of these very clearly, ALEC, when you say calculator brain ALEC, 
init, you own that object, okay? Because you sent it a message that starts with alloc. Same thing, copy. If I made a copy of an object, like a string especially, it's very common to copy those. Um, and then there's a bunch of methods, not a bunch, there's a few methods in iOS where you say new with something and you'll get an object there too. But these are three magic words. When you call a method that starts with one of those magic words, you own the object that comes back to you. Okay? So uh, if you get an object anywhere else, not from calling one of these three things, then you have to send the message retain to that object if you want to own it. And that's pretty much it. Okay? Pretty much, if you call one of these three magic starting word methods, you own the object, or if you send the message retain to an object, you own it. Okay? Yeah? What if uh, two objects pertain to each other, but then no other objects own that? Yeah, so the question is, what if I have two objects and they're each owning each other, and no one else owns anything? Well, as long as they continue to own each other, neither of them will ever get freed. Okay, neither of them ever get, ever get deallocated. One or the other of them is going to have to give up their ownership of the other one, right, for it to go away. And you're probably worried in your mind a little bit uh, about circular references. Or that. Turns out that's not going to matter, okay, because we're just talking about ownership here, and anybody can own an object, and if you, own, you wouldn't express ownership and keep ownership of an object unless you wanted to do something with that object. So you'll see that it works out in that sense. All right. So what about all the rest of the ways you get an object? So if you don't call new or alloc or copy, you call some other object, you have to spend, say, retain if you want to keep it. Um, how does that work? And because how is someone going to give you an object that they're going to give you the opportunity to retain and own, but they don't own it anymore? Because they don't want to own it until after they've, you know, they only want to own it long enough to give you a chance to own it yourself, and then they're done with it. They created it for you probably. Right, and make something for you, I want to give it to you, how do I return that from a method? Well, the answer is, there's a way to do this temporary ownership. And the, you, the only reason you would temporary, temporarily own an object, because you want to give it to someone else. And you want to give them a chance to retain it before it gets deallocated. Okay? The other way you can do it is, you can return an object from yourself that you own, and you're not going to get deallocated until a while down the road long enough for the person you're giving it to. This happens with instance variables. You give out one of your instance variables, presumably the person who called the property or the method in your object to get that uh, instance variable, you're going to live long enough that they're going to say they want to retain it before you get deallocated. Okay? But mostly we do it with this temporary ownership. Um, so we'll talk about temporary ownership in a second. So how do you give up ownership when you're done? So you have an object, you own it, either because of the magic three words or because you said retain, how do you give it up? Well, you send this message release. Release says, I don't want to own this uh, object anymore. Now, you have to be careful. If you say, here's an object, I'm retaining it. If you say release twice, that's bad. Because these releases are not kept track of between all the objects. It's a reference counting algorithm, right? So if you release it twice, you're releasing your own ownership and you're releasing someone else's as well some random person, you don't know, not a particular object, but you're lowering the reference count by two, so don't do that. All your retains and releases, all your takes of ownership have to be matched with releases of ownership, okay? And this is the number one kind of hard to find bug in your program is you're releasing, uh, releasing an object twice or you're not retaining it in the first place, okay? Those are going to be your two big memory allocation bugaboos, things you're going to have trouble finding. Um, is that. So you always have to match them. Now that might sound like a huge burden, but it turns out not to be that hard because releases happen mostly in the same place in your code. And we'll show you what that is. So let's go back to the temporary ownership. How do we do this temporary ownership thing? Uh, there's a special method in this object called auto release. And what auto release is means, sorry, what auto release means is I'm releasing this object. I don't want to own it anymore, but not quite yet. Okay? Wait until the call stack unwinds, basically. Or to be more accurate, it's wait until the event, loops, the event loop finishes processing this event. Okay? At the very end, presumably everybody involved who wanted to take ownership of that object so has a chance to retain it, and if no one does, boom, it gets released. Okay? So that's how we, we do this magic temporary ownership. We just send auto-release to an object. So 
Uh, I'm going to give you a couple examples here of how I would create an object to give it away using this auto release. Um, so here's show me the money. This is a method, and it returns a pointer to an object, money star. Again, some, uh, not something that's in the SDK, just something made up. Um, you know, it takes a double, which is a certain amount of money, and presumably makes that an object that's worth that amount of money and returns it. So what does the code look like to do this so that memory management works? All right, so first, I'm going to create the money. Okay, money equals money alloc in it with that amount. All right, so I've asked the money class to create one, to allocate some space for it, and to initialize it. Now, in this, after this line of code, we own the money, right, because we called alloc. Alloc is one of the three special words, so we own it. Now we're responsible for releasing it. If we don't release it, this memory will leak. It will never get freed out of the heap, ever. Okay, so we have to release this thing. Well, on the very next line of the code, I say, return the money. Uh, now I don't even have a pointer to the money anymore. I can't release it. So I can't execute my responsibility. You see the problem? OK. So how do we overcome this problem? Well, the answer is we use this auto release. Before I return it, I say, the money auto release. I've now satisfied my responsibility to release this object. But it hasn't quite happened yet, because if it happened right now, the object would deallocate it, and I'd be returning a deallocated object, right? A bad pointer. So that's no good. So by putting auto release in there, it's going to wait to do the actual deallocation of the memory until later. But meanwhile, I've satisfied my requirement um, to release this object. Now, the caller, whoever's calling this, they say money star my money equals bank object. Maybe this is a bank object implementing this. Show me the money. Give them the, the amount of money. And then they say, my money retain. Okay? And that my money retain makes it so that the caller owns my money right? before uh, it gets auto-released later. So when the auto-release happens a while later, it won't release because someone still owns it, namely the caller. Everyone make sense? Okay, so this is not the only way, though, to create an object and give it away. Okay, auto, uh, allocating and knitting it and then calling auto release is not the only way. So here's another example. Here I've created an array of cool cats. Here I've done the alloc and knit and I've returned it. This is bad. We saw on the previous slide. I'm going to make the same fix. I put auto release. Woohoo, I'm good. Uh, but there's a better way to do this than this. Okay, in fact, I'm going to show you two better ways to do it. All right, one is uh, to Instead of up there where I say NS mutable array alloc init, what if I asked mutable array to give me an auto released mutable array to start with? Okay, and I can do that by changing that line of code to say NS mutable array array. So array is a method in a class method in NS mutable array. It doesn't start with alloc or copy or new, so I don't own the object that comes back. So it must be in this magic auto-release state, right? So if it's in that state, I don't need this return value auto-release down here. In fact, I got to get rid of it, because otherwise it would release it twice at the end of the automatic releasing period, OK? So this makes the code a little simpler, right? Because I start out with an auto-released object that I got from an mutable array, and I add the objects I want to it, and then I return it. And this is perfectly fine. But there's an even better way to do this. And this comes into this whole thing of mutable arrays versus immutable arrays, and why, do you, why is one more common than the other? And that's that there's a method in array that just lets me create an array. It's immutable, but it lets me create it with the objects right in line there. See, NS array, array with objects, colon, and I just list the objects I want. I put nil at the end so it knows I'm at the end of the list of objects. And I don't need any of the rest of that code. Okay? And this method, array with objects, it doesn't start with alloc or new or copy, so it returns an auto release thing. Okay? So that's it. Does that make sense? How we do that? And there are other, lots of other convenient methods for creating uh, objects that are in this auto release state from the start. We've already seen string with format. Remember I did that the meaning of life is 42, meaning of percent uh, at sign is percent D. So that string with format method, that doesn't start with alloc or new or copy. So it returns something that's auto-released. If I wanted to keep that string, I would have to send retain to it if I called this. 
Same thing with dictionary with objects, array with contents of file even. Okay, it's possible to write arrays out to disk and read them back in. And when you do, the array you get back is auto-released. Okay, if you want to keep it, you retain it. If you don't retain it, it just goes away. All right? So you can see this all over the place, this auto-release mechanism. It's actually very few times when you have to call retain and release because most things are being auto-released. Um, you might be thinking from this previous slide, well, what about those strings that I put in that array? Who owns those? Okay, and that's a very good question. Who does own those? And the answer is when you put anything in an array or a dictionary uh, or a set, they take ownership until you remove it. Then they release ownership if it's mutable and you really uh, release it. Does that make sense? So that's important to understand. And a lot of times you'll put stuff in there and return it and if someone else wants to take it out because it's mutable, that's their responsibility to retain it when they get it out. Okay? But when they get it out, they'll have a chance uh, to retain. Um, by the way, at s yeah, question. So when you said an array with stuff in it, will it then also call release on all the objects that it contains? Yes, the question is, if I have a, an array with a bunch of objects in it, and I release the array, I say, NS, you know, the array variable uh, release, will it release all the items inside? And the answer is yes, it will. Okay? Um, so this at sign string is kind of weird. Um, you can kind of think of them as auto-released, but really the answer is they never get released. They're constant. Okay? So you can make a lot of mistakes with at sign strings because you can release it all you want, you can retain it all you want, you're not going to leak and you're, not, you're never going to get a bad pointer. They're constant strings, this at sign quote. But you can kind of code, when you're coding, think of them as auto-released, kind of. The other thing about strings, we don't usually retain strings. Okay, we copy them. This is the only class, really, where I think we re routinely say copy rather than retain. And the reason we do that is because when we copy a string, we get an immutable version of it, even if the thing we copied was mutable. Okay, and a lot of times if someone's handing us a string as an argument, they might have built it up using NS mutable string, and they hand it to us, but we don't want to be having a pointer to something that we can, you know, muck around in, right? We don't want it to be mutable for us unless our API says mutable string. We just want to get a string that's nice and safe and read only, and so we send copy. And, and a string very efficient at doing copy. Okay? So don't feel like, oh, I'm copying this whole string, it's killing me. It's very, very efficient. If it's already immutable, it's just basically like a reference count, it's kind of like retain. Um, if it's mutable, it's going to copy the bits out of there, but in a very efficient way. So string objects we usually copy, not retain. Any place you would think about retaining a string, you probably want to copy it actually. Um, one kind of programming technique you thing, you want to release objects as soon as you can. Don't have an object sitting around, you have ownership of it, but you're really never going to do anything with it again. You're just too lazy to release, or you're going to, you promise you're going to release it some other time. Release it right away, okay? The reason for that is people reading your code will know that you're not going to intend to go use that object later, okay? So, Release them as soon as you know you don't want them anymore. It's not an efficiency thing, it's just more of a code readability thing. Okay, deallocation. So what happens exactly when the last owner calls release? Nobody owns this object anymore. A special method in NS object uh, called dealloc gets called, all right? And, and in addition to that, the object's memory is returned to the heap, okay? To be reused, obviously, okay? After this, if you call a method in that object, it will crash your program, okay? So let's talk about dialloc. You should override dialloc in your class, but never call dialloc. You don't ever call dialloc. Okay, dialloc is called for you when the last owner releases. You never call dialloc. Every quarter, it seems like, people get this a little confused, and they say, oh, I'm done with this object, I'm gonna call dialloc to deallocate it. No, never, okay? You call release. And when the last owner has released, now it will deallocate it. Um, the, what you do in your dealloc, by the way, when you subclass it, is you release your instance variables. You don't dealloc them, you release them. You call release on all your instance variable objects. Okay? That's what you do in your dealloc. Because if your dealloc is being called on you, you're done. Your heap is going to get, your space in the heap is going to get uh, eliminated. So you might, you've got to clean up everything. And there's nothing you can do to stop it at that point. You've already been 
you're already headed towards deallocation. You cannot stop it. So in your dealloc, you want to clean up all the memory usage you're doing. So most of your alloc inits in your code, the releases, since alloc init is like doing a retain, right? You, it's alloc, so you own it. Your releases corresponding to that are going to be in your dealloc because you're going to be alloc and initing instance variables mostly, like the calculator brain, which is a brain, right? That was instance variable in our controller. We're, we did not put release for our brain in our dialog, and we needed to, okay? So in your assignment today, one of the requirement tasks, or required tasks is go back to the calculator thing we did last week and fix the memory allocation problems, and that's the one you're going to want to fix, okay? You're going to want to release that brain in your dialog, okay? Um, I say you can never call dialloc. Actually, there is one place you call dialloc, which is in your dialloc, you got to call super dialloc. Because obviously, you want to give your super class a chance to release its, its instance variables too. Right? So that's the only time you ever call dialloc. Inside your dialloc, you call super dialloc. That's it. So here's an example of a dialloc. Uh, maybe it's my controller. I've enhanced it some. I have, I'm releasing my brain. I've got other object instance variable. I'm releasing that. And then I'm calling super dialloc. Simple. Okay, this is what your dialogs always look like. Just release your instance variables, super dialog. And some people say, well, I should set release, I should set my brain to nil now or something, because I just released it. It doesn't matter. This object's never going to see the light of day. Okay? It's going to be dialoged. So you don't have to do anything except for do your releases. Okay. At sign properties. Um, there's some special memory allocation consideration with at sign properties, right? Because you have to understand who owns an object that's returned from a getter or that you pass in as an argument to a setter. Okay, you want to be a little bit careful about who owns this here. So getter methods usually return instance variables directly. Not always, especially read-only getter methods sometimes calculate something they're going to return. But sometimes you have things where they're returning things directly. When you do that, usually you're not going to uh, retain them in extra time and auto-release them, usually. Sometimes you might, though. Usually you're just going to return it, and the person who's calling it uh, is going to count on the fact that they're not going to deallocate you, they're not going to release you, until they've made a decision to retain your instance variable through the, uh, uh, through the property. So usually the getters, is, you just don't do anything special. You just return whatever you want to return. Uh, however, if you have a property which is a special property, like it's calculated somehow on the fly, or you're giving it away, but you don't want anyone to modify it. That's a common thing, right? You want to give away like a copy of your instance variable. Does that make sense? You want to give away that data, but you don't want them to be able to mess up the internal state of your object. Uh, then you might retain or copy the object and then auto-release it and then return it. Okay? And you're going to have to do that in your assignment uh, today. Uh, so uh, here's an example of... Um, this assign property thing. So display is a UI label, remember from our calculator, and we're using its property text, which is a read write ns string, okay? And we are using it here. Uh, I'm just going to go through what happens here so you understand where the ownership of this property happens. So first, inside my square bracket there, I call display.text and I get the text string back. Okay, when I got this back, um, if I wanted to keep it, I'd have to send it retain. Okay? But I'm not going to keep it. All I'm going to do is pass it to this other, I'm going to use it rather, to call this other method, string by appending string, and get myself a new string back. So I never used, the, I never kept the return of display.txt. I never kept it. I only used it briefly. I don't have to, since I didn't take ownership of it, I don't have to release it. Same thing here. This string by appending string, it doesn't start with alloc or new or copy, so I don't own that either. And I'm not going to keep it either. I'm going to go use display.text, which is the setter for the text property in UI label, right? I'm going to use that to set the string. So I never owned any of these strings and then didn't need to because I was only using them temporarily, right? So that's very common usage with these properties. Um, but what about, so that's property getter method. What about the property setter methods? When you set an object, uh, in, you know, via property, does it get, does the object that you set it on, do they take ownership of it? Right? Generally, they probably want to. Why else would they be having you set this thing on them if they weren't going to 
own it. All right. So unfortunately, though, uh, and so if you, in your implementation of a setter, you would want to say retain on the argument of the thing that was handed to you to set um, in your object. But what about at sign synthesize? Because it makes that setter for you. How do you make it retain? Okay, it's not done automatically. Instead, you have to use this notation: at sign property parentheses retain and s array star my array. So this is a property. It's an array. Okay, and the setter that synthesize makes is going to retain that thing. Okay, the second line copy, same thing except it's going to copy it. That would normally use with a string, an s string star. And then the third one is assign. That's when it's not going to retain or copy it. And there is one really important place that we do this in iOS, which is when we set the delegate of a view to be its controller. Okay. I talked about delegates, all the will, should, did, do you remember that? Well, when you do that, the view doesn't really want to retain its controller because its controller owns the view. Remember, the view is like the controller's minions. So the controller generally creates the view and owns it, and the controller is going to live longer than the view at all times. The view is always going to live shorter time because the controller owns it, it's, it's its minion. So there is not the retained back pointer there from the view of the controller. Um, that's all I'm going to say about today because I, I'm running out of time and I need to show you this demo. Um, so here's an example of what at sign synthesize will create if you use retain. Notice that it will release the previous value of the instance variable before it retains the new one. You see that? Also notice that the retain method returns the object you sent it to. So you can do this name equals a string retain. You don't have to say a string retain and then name equals a string. Same thing with auto release. You can return that directly. Um, here's copy, exactly the same. Notice it releases it because copy is one of the three magic words. So when I said copy of it, I took an ownership. I have to release the old version. Everyone understand why we're releasing the old version? I could, this setter could be called multiple times. I've got to keep releasing the previous one I retained or copied so I can set the new one. And then here's the one with a sign. There's no copying or retaining going on, so there's no releasing going on either. This is, kind of, this is the default, unfortunately. Maybe fortunately. All right, so next time I'm going to talk about view hierarchy and custom views, the application lifecycle, the view controllers lifecycle, navigation controllers. We're really going to start getting into the heart of how you build a significant uh, application next time. Uh, but now, right now I'm going to do a demo. Got 10 minutes to do it. It's going to be tight, but we'll see. Uh, the demo is called Collector. I'm going to post full code, even though in 10 minutes I'm only going to get part of this code done. I'll post the full code. I already have, actually, or maybe not. But right after the lecture, I'll post um, the full code uh, for this thing. Uh, what it does is really simple. It collects objects, strings and numbers, and then reports statistics about them. How many numbers it collected, how many strings it collected, et cetera. Uh, this is obviously contrived to show you how to do introspection and arrays and dictionaries, et cetera. So in this demo, the model, our model, is this class called collector that I'm going to create. Uh, the view is just going to be a bunch of random buttons that have strings and numbers on them, and when you click on one, it's going to collect it. Uh, and our controller is going to be collector view controller, and all it's going to do is uh, get the messages from the buttons and turn around and call the model uh, to collect. As I do this, watch for how we use NS number to wrap primitives, how we use introspection, and how we do properties. Okay, and also enumeration and some other things if I get to that. Um, so that's the demo I'm going to do. Uh, so I'm going to start from scratch here in Xcode. Uh, and I'm just going to create a new project. Um, I'm going to call it controller, or sorry, collector. Collector. Um, so it's the same as when we did our calculator. You can see here we've got um, our view controller right there. And we've also got um, our uh, view, which is our calculator view controller. I'm going to start off right away by creating my model, which I'm going to call collector. Collector. All right, and so um, actually, I'm going to move collector up to my classes here. Uh, so let's talk about the API for our collector class. Um, it's going to basically have one important method. Let me make this window bigger, sorry. Okay. Um, so it's going to have one important method, which is called collect. Okay. And collect is going to take an ID, 
any random object, and it's going to collect, collect statistics about the objects that uh, it collects. So you just call collect on it a whole bunch of times with strings or numbers. It could be enhanced to do other things over time, but that's the two it's, it's going to do. And then it reports st statistics. So the two statistics I'm going to do here, um, I'm making them properties. One is uh, total string count, and the other statistic is total number count. Okay, now the way I'm going to implement my collector is I'm going to have a, di a mutable dictionary. Mutable dictionary uh, called counts. And what counts is going to do is it's just going to count every time an object of any kind comes in. So if the same object comes in five times, this dictionary's value with that object as the key is going to be five. Okay, so the values in this dictionary are NS numbers, and the keys are either NS strings or NS numbers. Okay, make sense? Really simple, somewhat contrived, but I want to be able to show you how to do dictionaries and stuff. So um, let's write collect first. So void collect ID an object. And collect is really straightforward. It's just going to say if an object is a string, string or if an object is a number, because that's the only two things I'm going to handle in this class. Again, it could be enhanced over time. Then I'm just going to um, find out how many uh, of this object I already have and just add one to it. So I'm going to say ns number existing count equals self dot counts. Okay, I'm going to have to have a private property for my uh, counts. Object for key this object. So I'm just going to say for this object, what's my existing count? And then I'm just going to say update the counts. Counts set object, oops, ns number, number with int, uh, existing count int value plus one for key and object. Hopefully I got all my square brackets right there. And that's it. So that's all collect is going to do. But I do need a private uh, thing here for my count, so I'm going to say interface collector uh, at sign property uh, ns mutable string, sorry, dictionary star counts. And, and then I'm going to at sign synthesize counts. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to lazily instantiate that, so I'm going to go ns mutable dictionary star counts if not counts counts equals ns mutable dictionary alloc init and then return counts now okay anytime you type alloc or new or copy you immediately want to think where am i going to release this okay always that's always what you want to think so i'm thinking where am i going to release this well this is an instance variable so i'm going to release it in my dialloc Okay, I'm just going to say counts release super dialloc. Okay, so now whew, I'm safe. I've alloc something, but I've released it. I'm good. All right. So let's collect. Um, let's do um, total string count here. Total string count. Uh, pretty straightforward here. I'm just going to collect the total number of strings by doing this uh, enumeration. So key in self dot counts. Right, so I'm just going through enumerating through my keys. I'm going to say if this key is kind of class a string, then total plus equals the value for this key. Self dot counts object for key key int value. Okay, because that's how that's how we're keeping track of how many of that object there are uh, in there. And then I'm going to return total. Okay. Uh, number is, I'm going to, for speed here, I'm just going to copy and paste. You probably want to factor this code out would be better, but I'm going to just change it. Total number count, change this to NS number, like that. Oops. Okay, so that's that. Um, let's see, this is a problem here. This is read only. Oops, read only. 
All right, so that's it. That's my model. I'm, I'm completely finished with my model. Uh, the next thing I'm going to go do is um, do the view controller uh, interface, not the implementation of it, but the interface of it. The only thing my view controller has is it has the model. So collector star, uh, I'm going to call it model, actually. Could call it collector, maybe, but and I better import collector.h. And then it's going to have a couple of outlets. I'm going to show this total string count and the total number count uh, in some text fields. So I'm going to have IB outlet, uh, UI label, star total strings, and IB outlet, UI label, star total numbers. Okay. Uh, I only have one target action here, which is collect. It's going to take a button as its sender, similar to our calculator. And I'm just going to get the sender. I'm going to ask if it has a number on it. If it has a number, I'm going to put a number in the collector. If it has a string on it, I put a string in the collector. Um, let's do our UI really quick here. Um, the UI is very simple. I'm just going to have a la label here, which is strings. Uh, we'll make that a little bigger. We can. Right there. We'll make the alignment there. So I'm just, this is just a label here, copy and paste, strings and numbers. And then we'll make another couple labels to actually show the values. Start them out zero. Paste like that. Let's wire these up. So I'm holding down control and dragging out. Uh, this is total strings. Control, drag this out. This is total numbers. Um, then I'll just get a button, bring it out here. Uh, this is going to be my prototype for sending collect. So I'm wire that up to collect. Uh, and then I'm just going to copy and paste this a whole bunch of times. Paste, 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 paste. Oops. I'm going to make a really nice UI here, well lined up. Okay, and we'll put some words in here, maybe red. How about uh, cat? How about some numbers, 7 and 35.4? And how about like hello? And maybe good, oops, goodbye. And up and down. Okay, so. Remember, I copied and pasted them, so they're all pointing. They're all going to say collect. Uh, so that's the end of that. We go back here. We'll do our implementation of our controller. Um, I'm going to get rid of all the junk in here, except for I'm going to keep dialic this time. And I am going to uh, dialic my model. Release. OK. So now let's do the collect. IB action, collect. UI button star sender. Here's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to get its double value. And I'm going to say double value equals the sender's title labels text's double value. And I'm just going to say, if the double value is non zero, I'm going to assume it's a number. So if I had a zero on a button, that wouldn't work, but yeah, whatever. So if it is a double value, then I'm going to say to my model, uh, I'm going to, for expediency, do this here. Uh, so I'm going to say my model collect an NS number, number with double, double value. Uh, oops. Otherwise, I'm going to have my model just collect the sender's title, oops, sender's title label text. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to actually put the, just for speed here if my model is not created then my model equals collector alloc init and again I released it here in dialloc so that's good uh, the last thing I want to do here is uh, update my UI every time they press a button here so I'm going to create a little private method update UI and it's just going to say uh, total numbers uh, oops, total numbers dot text equal, uh, sorry, yes, equals, not this thing, and a string, string with format, percent G, uh, it's actually percent D, uh, and then I'm going to guess my model, uh, total number count, there you go, and total strings, 
dot text equals an s string string with format uh, print, print d model dot so now this is probably not that good because if my update UI got called before my collect, then this would crash because or well, it wouldn't crash, but it would print zero, which maybe that's okay actually. Maybe that's not even a bad way to have this work because my model is only created right here. So anyway, I think this should work. This is speed programming. We'll find out here. So now see as I press on numbers. Tells me more and more and more numbers if I press on a word. So you can see it's collecting, uh, collecting the statistics on what's pressed. Okay. Now, a couple of things let me tell you about. Uh, one is uh, the code that's posted online. I did a couple more things like I actually create a set of all strings that were ever uh, added. Okay. And the, since a set only has each string in there once. Um, then it's possible to find out how many unique strings or how many unique numbers as well. So take a look at that because you will have to do a set um, on your homework as well. Um, I'm going to take, I know I'm over time here, but I'm going to take one minute uh, to talk about your homework uh, just so you have a feeling for what that's about. It's, it's, uh, it'll be posted right after this lecture. Your homework is basically going to be to take your existing calculator and modify it so that it works with variables. So that instead of just saying 3 plus 4 equals, I can say 3 plus x equals. Okay, and it's going to remember an expression with could be multiple uh, ex uh, variables, and then you're going to have a, like a test button uh, on your UI that just says solve, and it's going to kind of pick random numbers for your variables just to, for it to solve it and see uh, if it's doing the right thing. So this homework is primarily about how to do introspection. You're going to need uh, a mutable array in there for sure. Uh, you're going to want to understand a little bit about how to build an API in Objective-C. I actually show you a new API for your calculator brain. And that home, this homework is really about your calculator brain. The, all you're doing in the UI and the controller is mostly just putting the button so that people can press on uh, variables and then also that little solve testing button. So this is really about building a calculator brain that has a more sophisticated uh, API. Okay. And uh, it's, I don't walk you through the whole thing like we did last week where I'm showing you every single button to click. However, I am going to mostly walk you through this one, uh, how we're going to kind of do this, you know, how we're going to implement this, et cetera. So I'm not really quite expecting you to be able to just automatically go out and build something sophisticated in Objective-C, uh, but I still want you to get the feel for what it's like to use all these various classes and such like like that. So um, it seems like a long homework, but it's actually not a lot of code to write. Um, there's a lot of explanation in the homework as well. If you have any questions, uh, you know where to find us. And sorry for keeping you late, and I will see you next week. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.